Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible, Bible Talk. Talk. And we're glad that you can be here with us, here today, being in Strokestown, Ireland. They tell us it's the heart of Ireland, right? Top of the morning. Top today. of the morning, yeah. Of course, that's only if it's morning. That's right. So we're here for a couple of weeks ministering, and uh, we just had the opportunity to film while we're here. So yes. I thank the Lord for that. Amen. As we continue on in our look, and what we've been doing for the past few weeks, as we are in the Sermon on the Mount, which is normal Christianity as opposed to common Christianity, yes. we're looking at that model of prayer that Jesus gave to the disciples, to us, mm -hmm. as to how we are to communicate with the Father Amen. through Jesus. So we're at the point now, we're at the end of that prayer, typically called the Our Father. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at, uh, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. And last week we talked about the kingdom, the kingdom yes. of God. And so today we're going to talk about the power, power of God. God. Hallelujah. But before we do that, I'm going to ask my sweet patootie Alice here to ask God's blessing on our time together. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We come before you with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. We rejoice in you, Lord. We love you. We thank you for all that you're doing in our life. And Lord, we thank you especially for this precious yes. word that guides and directs our lives, that gives us the power to proclaim you. Yes. And Lord, we just ask that you would prepare the hearts to receive what it is that you would yes. speak to all of us today. And we do this in the name of your precious Holy Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're in that prayer. For thine is the power, right? For thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. It says in Psalm 62, 11, Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. But amazingly, he has entrusted us with that power. And it's important to know whose power we've been entrusted with. Amen. Lest, like those of whom who Jesus speaks about later on in chapter 7, verses 21 and 23, mm -hmm. we take the credit for his work mm -hmm. in us. Right? Think about Peter, and I just wanted to say this, when, when he was used so powerfully in Acts chapter 3 mm -hmm. to heal somebody. And people, they started to give glory to Peter for it. And, but when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel... Why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power we had made him walk? Acts 3.12 God uses us. It's not for our glory. It's for his glory. It's for his purpose. We need to be really prayerful as we come to a greater understanding of how to use the power of God that we don't start to take credit, credit for, for the, the power, power of God. God okay? okay? And that power comes from us being connected to, plugged into God's power by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. You know, here in Ireland and in the UK where we spend a lot of time, their, their power switches, their electrical outlets, mm -hmm. are different than those that we're accustomed to in the United States of America. Right. You know, in the United States, you take an electrical outlet, you plug in, and bada-bing, bada-boom, there you are. You've got the power. Here... You can plug in and nothing happens. Mm. Because even though there's power at the other end, and even though you've got an appliance here, there's another thing that has to be done. They have a little switch on all of their electrical outlets. And you have to throw that switch to turn it on. That's right. You know, when you're saved, when you become a child of God, you are, you do have the Holy Spirit. Yes. You're plugged in. You're plugged into the, you're connected to the power, but something, you have to throw that switch that turns it on. And that is the baptism in fire, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that turns the power on in your life. So we'll, we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about a lot of things about the power of God because it is most, it is supremely important. Yes. Because if you're not walking in the power of God, you're going to start walking in your own power and your own understanding. And you know what? You'll be a mess. It's very okay. dangerous. Very dangerous. Is it, we've talked about the price. There's a price to receiving this power. And I think the great example of that is what Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians. Because uh, he willingly suffered the loss of all yes. things, saying, 
whatever things were gained to me, I'm reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 10, by the way. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. You know, I've, I've done a sermon, a teaching around the world that blesses me every time I, I have the opportunity to speak it, and I know that it's blessed a lot of people. And it's about the attitude of the righteous. It's about having that attitude. And in, in, here in Philippians... Paul talks about having the same mind, the same attitude as was in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I'm, just, I'm not going to go through that right now, because uh, if you're interested in it, it's up on the Bible Talk front page, I believe, actually, the attitude is righteous. Yes. But it's comprised of seven things that changes you, to, truly changes your attitude and the way you think and the way you act. Mm-hmm. And it's understanding, they're all, all seven things begin with a P, by the way, and they all come from the Apostle Paul, and they all come from the fl- letter to the Philippians. God makes things so easy for us. There's purpose. We need to understand our purpose. There's praise. God formed the people to declare his praise. We are to be that people of praise. There is price. Jesus said, count the cost. We need to understand what the price is to follow Jesus Christ here on this world. And there is power. The power that I just talked of from Philippians. The power, knowing the power of God's, Jesus' resurrection. And perspective, the way you see things. Because when you are, your mind is being changed into the mind of Christ, which we have been given, you start to see things differently. And that gives you perseverance, the ability to press on, which is what he says, forgetting what lies behind, to press on towards the goal. And the last P is prayer, because we are to be a people of prayer. But of those seven things, it struck me not long ago, the middle one is power. The center of all of this is power. Because without the power of God, you'll not do any of the others. That's right. You'll not have an effective prayer life. You'll not understand your purpose and be able to fulfill your purpose. You'll not be that people of praise that He formed us to be without the power of God active in your life. So I want to talk about that, all right? And it, it says in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. Yes. And Alice... My mathematical sweetheart over here has always said that the answer, <laughs> well, her mathematics is just a little different than the, than the norm, that's all. It's true. <laughs> she says the answer is always three. Right. Well, the Word of God says that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. And in order to understand the power of God, there are three things that you truly need to put together, to entwine together, to get the strength of this those three, three things are faith, authority, and power. Listen to this now. Um, 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Then Jesus said in Matthew, Matthew 28, 18, He said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There's authority, right? Mm -hmm. And, listen to this one now. We talked about this last week, about the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. All right? So those three things, the faith, the authority, and the power, combine To bring us to a place where we truly walk and live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can't take, again, I've been talking about, you can't take credit for this. This is the work of God. Oh, and all I want in my life is the work of God in my life. Okay? That's right. He's at work to work His will and His pleasure in our lives. He is the potter and we are the clay. He is the one that is doing the work, therefore He gets the credit, right? 
For who regards you as superior, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you have not received it? Okay? We can't boast in what God has done. All right? We have to boast in God. Amen. If any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Right? So God equips you for what he calls you for. Every Christian, if you've been following this, this series in search of Christianity, you know how many times I've talked about the fact, the most important fact, is that every single Christian, every true believer, has a ministry. Yes, there is a fivefold ministry, but ministry is not restricted to that fivefold ministry. As a matter of fact, the, the only ministry of the fivefold ministry is to equip the rest for the work of service, for their ministry. So if God is going to give us what we need to do this, well, it says he's given us faith. Romans 12, 3 says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. God's given you the faith. You've been given authority. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. The words of Jesus Christ. So he's given you faith, and he's given you authority. And he has given you the power. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of discipline, a sound mind. Amen. Right? 2 Timothy 1, 7. So you, let's try and connect the dots here, so to speak, all right? We need to see how this operates in reality, in real life, how this works. I'm going to read, you may want to, I was going to say you may want to open your Bibles. You most assuredly should open your Bibles. Test because I've said so many times, don't trust me, test me. That's right. Test the things I say. Check me out and see if what I'm saying is the Word of God or it's not the Word of God. My opinions have no value. But the Word of God is everything, all right? Amen. So if what I'm saying to you is the Word of God, well, now you're responsible for it. If it's not the Word of God, what are you doing watching? Turn it off. Get away from here. Many false prophets have gone abroad. This is what John said. Test the spirits, for many false prophets have gone abroad. So anyhow, it's a really good idea, if you're coming to a Bible study, to have a Bible. Yes. So you can test it and see if what I'm saying is true. And it's, it's accurate, because, you know, you can wrongly divide the Word of God. This is what Paul cautioned Timothy about, right? Matthew 8, 5 through 10. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormenting. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord... I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled, and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Hallelujah. You know, I've asked people so many times, who are the, who, when you think of the great faith heroes of scriptures, you may think of Abraham, you may think of Moses, you may think of Jesus, oh, no, no, no. you better be thinking of Jesus, uh -huh. you may think of Paul, you may think of Peter, but the centurion, Jesus said he hadn't seen such great faith in all of Israel. And the centurion didn't say he had faith, he said he understood authority. And I, I, just, I just want to look at that for one minute, because it, it's really worth a look, all right? The first thing is that centurion calls Jesus Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to tell you something. Centurions, Roman centurions in the time of Jesus, were powerful people. And they didn't call many people other than Caesar Lord. Mm -hmm. But this centurion came to Jesus Christ, this humble carpenter, yes. ah, and said, Lord. Nothing's going to happen in your life until you recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And then the servant said, I'm not worthy. That's humility. If we're not walking in humility, may God never, if you're not having, walking in humility, may God never trust you with power. Because if you're not humble, humbled before the Lord, you'll use the power for your own 
to serve your own purposes, not God's purposes. And thinking about that, people who are in authority, if you have, if you're aware of people that you have to deal with and they're in authority, you have to trust them. That's well, faith. If you, it, it certainly is a lot better to trust them. Yeah. Okay. Because if you, th one of the things about authority, and this is what the centurion was saying, he said, you know, I tell somebody to, to go, he goes. Yeah. If I tell somebody to come, he comes, right? right? Because we are called to be submissive to authority, right? But think about this. that The centurion said to Jesus, for I also am a man under authority. I love that word, also. Mm -hmm. That means he recognized that Jesus was under authority. Yes. And Jesus truly was a man under authority. That's right. He, he didn't speak a word that he had not heard from the Father. Mm -hmm. He didn't do anything that the Father had not showed him to do. Jesus was truly under authority. I was talking to somebody this morning about prayer and talking about submissiveness. And think about it. Jesus, yeah. if you think that he felt like in the, in the natural to go to, to the cross, you better get back and read John 17, where he prayed. And he prayed a prayer so so difficult that he sweat blood doing it. And he said, Father, this cup could pass. Let it. Oh. But he said, no. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's the humility that led to Jesus saying of this centurion, that's the greatest faith. You know, and it, it's interesting because at roughly the same time, you may know the story of the seven sons of Sceva mm -hmm. in Acts 19. Acts 19, 11, 6 through 16. It says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. But also, some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place, attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus, who Paul teaches, preaches. I, that's, so he's, he's, they've seen the work of Paul. Right, right? Right. And these seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish pre, priest, were doing this, and the evil spirit that they were doing it to, eh, answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was this evil spirit leaped on them and subdued them, all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. That demon beat them up, beat them silly. Yes, what? Because they had not been given the authority. They had not been given the authority to do this. They think these demons, by the way, they recognize Jesus. And it says that they heard about Paul. How do they hear about Paul? How do you think demons heard about Paul? I'll tell you how. Because the demons ran all over wherever demons are, are, and they were saying, boy, if you run across that Paul, you better watch out. Because of what he was doing. Be because if, you, if a demon encountered Paul, the demon would be the worst word. That's not right. Paul. That's right. And that's the way it should be in our life if we are walking in the power of God, right? <sighs> they had not been given authority. Authority always provides the power to serve. Matthew 20, Jesus called them, his disciples, to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 25 to 28. I just wanted to point out on that with the seven sons, one of the things, too, is the fact that God did not call them. That was not their ministry. That's what I'm saying. They didn't have the authority That's to do right. that. If you try and do something that God hasn't given you authority to, you, you are in, you're going to be in trouble, right? right? That's why it's important, and I say the very first thing in that sermon that I, that I preach is about understanding your purpose. It's about understanding the ministry that God has called you to, that you should fulfill. Don't try and fulfill a ministry that God has given to somebody else. Right, because you won't have the power to do it. No, and you'll only cause confusion, yeah. disruption, and problems. And problems, okay? So, th Peter. Peter is the first apostle, right? And, and Peter himself... A, a truly, truly, truly a man of faith 
had troubles at times, often had troubles, with the idea of Jesus being subject to the authority of his Father. What? He would have preferred many times for Jesus to act, and put quotes around this, normal. Mm. Now, two instances of that come to my mind, all right? In John 13, starting at verse 4, and you'll, you'll know this, right? Mm -hmm. It talks about Jesus got up from supper and laid aside his garments at the last supper, right? Mm -hmm. And taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you don't realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, this is Peter talking to Jesus, Never shall you wash my feet. <laughs> Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Whoa. So Peter, Simon Peter said to him, oh, Then Lord, wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Watch off. Love that, Peter. I'm looking yes. forward to meeting him, I'll tell you what. You see, Peter reacted to the humility of Jesus Christ, knowing that Christ was the Messiah, right? God has called us to be humble. That has to be coupled with the power he gives us and the authority to use it. Another time, and please think about this, these are all scripture, every scripture, is God-breathed and profitable. Mm -hmm. Think about this. In Matthew 16, I'm going to read from 18 to 23, mm -hmm. it says, Jesus talking, he says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and, he ra and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside. Peter takes Jesus aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. You know, why do you think it says in Proverbs 3 that we're not to lean on our own understanding? God's ways are still not our ways. God's ways are still higher than our ways. I mean... Praise all things spiritual. Yeah, you have to. Listen, can you relate to, to what I'm going to share now? Everywhere I go, we've been to the West, in the West, all right? In America, in the UK, in Europe. I hear Christians asking today, where's the power? Yeah. I mean, true. where's the power? Where is this power of God in our lives? The real question, the better question might be, where is the understanding of authority? Romans 13, verses 1 to 2 says, Every person, talking about us, the believers, is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. That, that's Romans, but you can look in 1 Timothy, you can look in Titus, you can look in 1 Peter, you can look in Hebrews, you can look in Colossians, and it's on and on and on about how we are to be submitted to authority. Now, that would include speed limits, taxes, parking rules. It would include your boss at work and horror of horrors. It would include wives being in subjection to their husbands and children being subject to their parents and teachers. And yes, it includes husbands being submitted to God and loving their wives as Christ loved the church. And by the way, those words of Paul were written during the time of the reign of Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, better known just as Nero, the infamous Nero, who lit up the night sky by burning Christians. Be submitted. Because what it says 
Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 16, 10, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Be faithful in the little things. Rebellion can never be excused. The prophet Samuel said to Saul, the first king of Israel, as the Lord is much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Right? Amen. Saul lost his ministry. He lost his authority. He lost his power because he rejected God's authority. And his rebellion led him farther astray to even greater depths when he started. This is spiritual depravity when he turned to the witch of Endor. And in Deuteronomy 18, 10, 12, it says, There shall not be among, found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination or practices witchcraft. Saul did. And as Samuel the prophet said to him, The Lord has departed from you and has become your adversary. 1 Samuel 28, 16. The Lord watches over his word to perform it. Amen. One of the reasons that we are not seeing the power of God or maybe you're not seeing the power of God in your life is because you're speeding on the motorway. One of the reasons you may not be seeing the power of God is because you, you park where you shouldn't be parking illegally. And God is looking down at these little things and saying, well, if he's unfaithful in those little things, I can't trust him with the big things. And God withholds the power. Now, that sounds silly. Trust me, it is not. I just said to it, I was doing a teaching over in England across the other side of the Irish Sea, not long ago. And I said to people, the reason you're not seeing the power of God in your lives is because you're speeding on the motorway. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds silly, test it against the Word of God. Test it about against the things that I've just read to you here. Test it and see if God, and think, should God trust you if you show yourself to be untrustworthy in the little things? I want to see the power of God in my life. I want to see the power released for the glory of God. I want to see the power of God released to touch lives around us with the good news of Jesus Christ. This is a dark and dying world. And trust me, we've seen a lot of it. I mean, we've traveled, you know, I, I was just saying the other day, so far this year, Alice and I, I think we've been to 20 of the United States, and we've been to 13 or 14 countries so far this year. So we've seen a lot of different Christianity. And the simple fact of the matter is, it's not exciting what we're seeing. But it is truly exciting when you see somebody faithfully living it, that bondservant of the Most High God. Be faithful in the little things. God wants to give you power. He wants you to operate in your faith with the authority that He's given you for the glory of His name. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you can, that you have entrusted us, that you've given us faith, that you've given us authority, that you might give us the power, Lord, that we can be used for the glory of your name. That is the desire of our hearts, Lord God. So we want to know more of you. We want to be walking closer and closer to you. Just a closer walk with you, Lord, that is indeed our prayer. Well, once again, time flies when you're having fun. Don't forget to be back next time. Tell others and be with us. Bye-bye. So I cherish that old rugged cross Till my trophies at last